All right, so while I try to connect to the wireless, because at the end of today, hopefully I will show you something new in MATLAB, not the homework. I know you're all here because you hope to hear something about the homework. I'm not going to spend a single word on that. Um, but uh, my MATLAB well, Wi-Fi is not working, so hopefully, I don't know, it will decide to work by the end of the lecture. Now it's insecure connection. That's really nice. Oh, wow. Okay. Anyways, this is what we need to do. Moving to chapter three, uh, there are a, there's other stuff in chapter two that we may go back uh, to at some point, uh, like the three restricted three body problem um, and, uh, and more, but uh, it's time to move on. So, so far, what we've done is we said, okay, we, we use the perifocal coordinate system, which is made of unit vector along the direction of the eccentricity vector, a unit vector along the eccentricity, accent, the, I'm sorry, along the angular momentum vector, and then another one that completes the right-handed frame that you can call whatever you want. And in this coordinate system, we said, okay, we know that uh, the R vector connecting my attracting body, M1, and my spacecraft, M2, is such that uh, R is equal to H squared over mu, one over one plus E, and I don't know why, I'm going to the other board. How about that? Cosine of theta. Uh, that's, that's what we know. Uh, and we call theta the true anomaly, this angle here. So we have solved partially uh, the uh, gravitational equation, differential equation, by introducing this parameter theta. But uh, we know where the spacecraft is given an angle. We don't know what time it is when that happens, right? We don't know yet what this is, or a, which is equivalent what this is. And uh, in a few cases, that solution can be found analytically for a circular orbit and, and a parabolic one. Uh, but in general, it boils down to solving numerically a, uh, an equation, which is much easier than integrating six differential equations anyways. So what we're going to find today is the Kepler. So basically, to find this, we will get to the Kepler's equation, so I'm going to start as usual with um, circular and uh, elliptical. And I had a MATLAB file that at the end will solve that equation, we'll find. But of course, it's, it's not going to work. Okay, so um, there is a lot of trigonometry involved here, and I'm going to go fast over some things. I have a lot of things that I have to write down because you will see what kind of formulas we're talking about. Uh, but we just want to show how we get there. So what do we know uh, about theta? Um, well, we know that H is R V normal, right? And remember that simple exercise we solved at the beginning. We can say that this is also R squared theta dot. Do you remember where that is coming from? The pipe, the little particle in the pipe that goes around. So that's your normal velocity um, times r. And so from this equation, I can say that d theta in dt is equal to h over r squared. Nothing special. Since I know an expression for r, which is down here, taking two boards. Uh, I have h, let's see, over h to the fourth power, then I have a mu squared up here, I'm just uh, inverting this expression, and then I have a 1 plus e cosine of theta squared. And remember, this is dt, d theta in dt. So if we separate the variables, while well, simplifying a few things, this is q. <coughs> Uh, this is what I'm going to get. Uh, let's see, dt, it's multiplying h cubed over mu squared. And this is supposed to be, uh, no, it's the opposite, I'm sorry. Separating the variables the wrong way. I want to have dt on one side and d theta on, on the other side. So let's see. Uh, yeah, mu squared over h cubed makes a little more sense. It's equal to d theta over 1 plus e cosine of theta squared, right? Yes? Uh, 
Did I miss anything? The eight that you have on the bottom, does that do a four? No. That's a three. I simplified it with this one. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, that's what you get. So, in other words, uh, you want to find a way the way theta and t are related to each other, you need to solve this, this equation here. And this is in general for any e. I haven't specified what the e is. So solving it at least symbolically means that I integrate both sides and I get integral between, for example, the time where the spacecraft goes through perigee uh, and a generic time of mu squared over h cubed dt is going to be equal to uh, what is the true anomaly at perigee. By definition, we define the true anomaly 0 to a generic theta of d theta over 1 plus e cosine of theta squared. This we know how to solve. This is mu squared over h cubed t minus t at perigee is equal to this integral here. Okay. Now what we usually do is that uh, we can always choose the passage at perigee to be zero. We just decide that that's when you start counting time or reset the clock or whatever it is. So you can, you can eliminate that. Uh, but still you have to deal with this uh, pretty interesting integral. Now I'm going to write here the known solutions for that integral depending on basically the values of the eccentricity. Mm, now, of course, we all know this. We all keep in our memory that case one, if you have this function, integral of dx over one plus, I'm sorry, I just, let's do it in general, a plus b cosine of x squared. Okay, this is what you have, a squared, minus b squared, 3 over 2, and here the fun begins, 2 a arc tangent of, wow, so this is a square bracket. Yeah, you all know this stuff, right? I knew this stuff. I use it all the time. No, I don't. Uh, but, you know, we, we, need, we just need to know that that's the start point. Okay, okay so this is our tangent of all these things, and I'm not done. Plus, minus b, a squared minus b squared sine of x, a plus b cosine of x. Now, and this one, case 1, is only valid when b is less than a. So this is only the beginning. This is what we're going to use today. It's, it's known, it's in some books, okay? Uh, we're just going to use it. So the case A, look at this and look at that integral down there. Uh, A will be 1, it's always 1 for us. And E is what can change, it's, it's B here, right? So the B less than uh, A is the circular and eccentric case, right? So E is less than 1. So we're going to use this. Uh, but I want to give you the other ones, just because we'll use them in the next lecture, so let's just be done with these uh, very nice expressions. So the same thing, same integral, now this is b equals to 8, so to a, this will be uh, your parabolic case, e equals 1. This is a little nicer actually, it's 1 over a squared, 1 over 2, tangent of x over 2 plus 1 over 6, tangent cubed of x over 2. When we'll do this, actually this is one of the cases where you do get a, a close form solution. You can actually directly relate theta and, and t. Okay, so this is case 2. And the third is as ugly as the first one, so I'm going to move to the not this board here. So this is a class where we use a lot of known results from math without asking too many questions. Okay? So dx over a plus b, I don't know why I keep writing the same thing, it's the same integral, the only difference is the relationship between a and b. So now, um, I'm sorry, yeah, now oh, it's a less uh, than b, right? Yep. 
Okay, this is uh, pretty long as well. B squared minus A squared. 3 over 2. Open brackets. B square root of B squared minus A squared sine of X. A plus B cosine of X plus minus just to make it more entertaining, there is a natural logarithm here of square root of b plus a over, yeah, when we get to do this for um, the hyperbolic uh, trajectories, we will uh, talk about hyperbolic sines and cosines. Remember those things? Have you ever seen them before? No? Yes? No? <laughs> Hyperbolic sines and cosines? Once. Once. Yeah, me too. This is the second time. Is that a question? Yeah, one, six. This is a 1 over 6, yes. Yep. So, um, I just need to give you these because we'll use them. Today we'll use the first one. Through a few tricks and defining what is called um, eccentric anomaly, another angle we will solve that. But let's do it for a circular orbit, which is pretty straightforward. <coughs> what happens if I have a circular orbit here? It's pretty, it's pretty easy, right? E equals zero, and I get mu squared over h cubed t is simply equal to theta. This goes away, pretty much. It becomes a one. You're integrating d theta between zero and theta. That's what, that's what you get. Um, R collapses into a constant, of course, because it's a circular orbit. So if you combine these two, actually, you get that T is equal to R, 3 over 2, square root of mu, theta. Um, if you want to prove it to yourself, solve for H from here. H is going to be uh, R mu square root, plug it in here, solve for t, that's what you get. Uh, does this remind us of anything? Kepler's third law, there was something about the orbital period. Uh, that is in general valid for a, uh, an elliptical orbit, but when it's elliptical, the a becomes the radius, right? So um, we remember that the period of a circular or elliptical orbit, it's 2 pi, that expression. This is an R. I know my, R are, my R's are terrible. I'm trying to improve. OK, uh, over square root of mu. And so the bottom line for a circular orbit, circular, I mean, you, you can leave it as it is. You can leave it like this, of course. Because when you are solving for an orbit, uh, I give you a position and a velocity, you always have to find the angular momentum vector. So you, you can stop there and just solve t. So if I give you theta, you can find t. If I give you t, you can find theta. You can do it from here. But uh, usually, we just write it the following way. Theta is 2 pi over the orbital period t, which makes sense. This is your orbital angular velocity. That's how fast your position vector is going around. And it's constant because it's a circular orbit. So this all makes sense. It's theta is equals to omega t. That's really nothing special. So what happens? Um, how do you actually approach the problem if you have a circular orbit? And, uh, <coughs> and you want to know, so if I give you a time and uh, you need to tell me where the spacecraft is, well, you find theta, right? Directly from here. So when is, where is the spacecraft going to be in half an hour? Just stick in half an hour in there with the right units and you get theta. Now the only problem is, where is E? There's no E. So you choose what that is. You choose the line of apps to be whatever you want. There's no E, but no one is going to prevent you from choosing a direction in space which is the one from which you're going to start ca counting the theta. You have to, you have to, you have to choose it. It's, it's up to you. You can choose any of the diameters to be the line of ups. That's, that's, uh, 
that's what it is. And then theta is just a linear function of time. There's nothing fun in that. Okay, so for circular, great, it's analytical, done. For elliptical, no. Ah, this is the one I needed. Okay. Ah, you have to be patient with me. I want to write it again because I will need it. Uh, at least I will have to compare with this what I'm going to do. 1 minus e, 1 plus e, tangent of theta over 2, and then I close this, and then I have e. one plus e cos theta sine of theta and done okay yes no i mean the uh, you know you, you can have circular orbits at any inclination so you're going to probably intersect the equatorial plane only twice every orbit, unless you are in a circular <laughs> orbit on the equator. So remember that the way we're looking at orbits is the following. The h vector is sticking out. It's looking at us. So we're looking from above at this orbit. And in this case, it's a circular one, right? Uh, but from the ECI point of view, this is our planet. And this is you know, the coordinate axis that we choose as fixed uh, and in the ECI. I mean, a circular orbit can be anything doing this, for example, around the planet. It goes beyond, be behind the planet and it comes back again. Um, so we are actually looking, and this is your h vector. When we use the perifocal frame, what we've been doing for a few weeks now is that we put ourselves up here and we look down. And we look at this object going around, in this case, in a circle. So um, in this case, for example, you are intersecting uh, the equatorial plane here and, and in the back. Yeah, we'll go at some point, uh, we'll go back into ECI and we'll define some parameters that we call uh, orbital parameters uh, that tell us how that uh, track, pretty much, that we're running on is oriented in space. We'll talk about the inclination that will be the angle between h and the z vector of the ECI. We'll talk about this little angle here, which is the right ascension of the ascending node and other, other nice features that allow us to tell us uh, everything about the orbit. But for now, we are in this plane. Any other questions? So how does that look like if I stick a equals to 1 and b equals to e? I get, well, this, this is the integral that I need to solve, right? And so I'm going to rewrite that with the right variables in it. It's not that different, of course. Arc tangent of, well, that. Ah, oh. I mixed things, I'm sorry, I was looking at the right, uh, yeah, this is A and B. This is the general expression, just to, be, just to be completely thorough here. This is A and B, 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 right? I'm sorry. You should, uh, you should uh, if you covered it before, that was the generic one. A, B, A, B, A squared minus B squared, and there is a B here, and there is a a here and there is a B here. I was already moving on with substituting E and 1. Okay, uh, well, 1 minus E, 1 plus E, ah, the tangent of theta over 2. Uh, okay, this is closed here. And then the rest. Okay, this is also equal to what? The other side is time, right? The other side is that integral over time, mu squared, h cubed, t. And uh, usually you will see this term moved here, so remove it from here. We just multiply both sides, 1 minus e squared, 
3 over 2 time is equal to this nice expression there. Okay, uh, what people usually do, we call this, the whole expression, mean anomaly. And I think your book uses this, ME. <coughs> It's just a convention, we call it that way, this expression. This is a constant times t. And E indicates that we're talking about ellipses. We'll define some kind of mean anomaly for parabolas and hyperbolas too, they look different. Yes? Is that a mu subscript E or an m subscript E? m subscript E. All right, well, if you want, you can go back to the calculations we've done about orbital period and rewrite the mean anomaly in a, another way. It's just manipulating constants, nothing more than that. If you recall, when we computed the orbital period for uh, an ellipse, at some point we also had something like this. 1 minus e squared to the third. So if you take these and uh, substitute there, well, the bottom line is that you can write the mean anomaly similarly to what I've done before, 2 pi over t, t. Now, this is not the orbital angular velocity anymore because it's not constant for an ellipse, right? But it's the average orbital velocity. You go around 2 pi in one period, and that's divided by the period. So this actually also has a name. It's called little n. That's usually the letter you would find. And it's called mean motion. Now mean as in average, not as in being mean. OK? That's a bad joke, I know. Uh, all right. Well, there's nothing fun here. Let's, let's do the fun part. So how do I deal with this ugliness here? The problem is that um, on, on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side you have t. And it's a constant times t, right? So on the left-hand side from now on, you will see 2 pi over t multiplying times. And on the right-hand side, I have ugliness, right? Is that how you write it? I don't know. Was it right before? I'll remove it from the video. Oh, well, I, I have to write something here. Uh, I have a function, the, the reality is that I have a function of theta, right? Now, if I tell you where, the, where is, um, let's see. If I tell you theta is a given value, but I'm basically telling you where the spacecraft is, right? You can find time. It's pretty easy. You plug it into this uh, expression. You plug in your theta value and you get t. That's easy. So one way it's approachable. The other way is not that easy. If I ask you where is the spacecraft in 10 seconds from perigee or 10 hours from perigee or whatever, because remember this is now the time from perigee passage, the way I've defined <laughs> tp is zero. Well, good luck inverting this thing, right? Because you have to invert for theta and it doesn't look that friendly, right? So uh, the way this is done is introducing even more functions. So if this is my line of ups, and uh, this is my eccentric orbit, and my attracting body or focus is here, and uh, let's see, and I, so the same major axis is, is A, right? So this is C, this distance is 2A, as we know, okay? Okay, I'm going to draw the circle of radius A that contains this ellipse. I'm going to look at a generic position of the spacecraft on the ellipse. So this is my vector R. And I will continue this radius. I will just elongate it uh, until I intersect uh, at a point, whatever I call this Q, the circle. Okay, the angle between the radius of the circle through C and Q and the line of apps, this angle here, it's called E 
or eccentric anomaly. And uh, I'm going to use that. So from this point Q, I can project down here and uh, let's call this point down here V, for example. So um, there are two ways that I can express this uh, distance CV, two different ways. Can you tell me which ones they are? This radius is by construction is A, right? Okay. So, do you remember what this distance was between the center of the line of apps and the attracting planet? We computed that when we wanted to find R, you know, the cap what is it? AE. A okay. And then this is, of course, the true anomaly. I forgot to draw that. So. Uh, there are two ways that I can write C, uh, this, the distance between C and V. One way is A cosine of the eccentric anomaly. So I just take this radius and I project it down, and I use this angle here. Or it's uh, also AE plus R cosine of theta, which is AE. Now, one of the ways uh, the, we have expressed the R is the following, at least for a, um, an ellipse. Okay. Hmm. I think that can go now. Let me just double check that I have it right. Looks okay. Okay. So now I have this relationship where <clears throat> a cosine of e is equal to a e plus, uh, what do I have? a 1 minus e squared, 1 plus e cosine of theta, cosine of theta. Is that what I have down there? Yes. Well, we can, uh, for example, I'm going to use this. This is not just for fun. We're going to, to find actually these two expressions again. We're going to have something like this and something like this in a second uh, in, in, as a function of, of this angle big E. Um, OK, so we can solve in different ways. Cosine of E is going to be, well, if you do this math here, 1 plus C cos theta, denominator. Uh, it's E plus E squared cosine of theta plus cosine of theta minus e squared cosine of theta. And that gives me, put it here, e plus cos theta over 1 plus e <coughs> cos theta. That's one. So cosine of e is equal to this. You can also invert this and solve it as a function of theta. Cosine of theta is going to be e minus cosine of big E, little e cosine of big E minus 1. And also, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to start writing the things that, oh, no, it's the end. We're done. <laughs> I'm going to write it again. What was this? What was 1 plus e cosine of theta? Uh, what was I doing here? I was doing that. It was an e. There was an e. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's easy. Okay. The next line is solving for e. Okay, this is equal to this down here, right? So go here, and I'm done, I found this relationship. Now, if you want to, you can also solve this expression the other way around. Find cosine of theta as a function of e, and that's what you get, if you believe me. So at this point, it's really up to you how much of trigonometry you want to see, or how much you're going to believe me. Probably the second, right? Uh, well, so I'm going to write this, this, this one result here, because we'll, we'll use it. Cosine of e is e plus cosine of theta over 
1 plus e cosine of theta. Now if you use the sine squared of e plus cosine squared of e equals 1, you also get the sine of e. It's not that painful, believe me. 1 minus e squared sine of theta 1 plus e cosine of theta. So to get to this second one, just do this. Right? You have cosine of e, square it, and solve for this, take the square root, that's what you get. And so, um, I have those expressions up there. What do I do with them? I really don't want to erase the middle one. Nothing for now. Well, I already start to have a feeling that this is going to help me somehow. Uh, look at this expression and look at this piece. They are exactly the same. So this one is, is actually, other than as a little e, this is little e sine of the eccentric anomaly. So the bottom line is that we're going to be able to rewrite that expression there, removing completely theta and using the new variable eccentric anomaly that makes it, numerically speaking, a little easier to solve. But now we have to relate theta and e. And it seems like I have done it here. Um, but this is not the best way to connect two angles. Why? Because if, for example, I look at this one and I give you a theta value, uh, how many solutions do you have for little e? You get two, right? You can get two. The arc sine and arc cosine functions are dangerous. They are invertible only in certain ranges. The, arc, the sine is invertible between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, right? And cosine is 0 to pi. So I'm not satisfied with these two, but can I erase this? Can this go? Tangent functions are much better if you really want to remove ambiguity. And I think now it's the time to probably bring down the screen. I have, I have a few. Well, I have a few images from the book that may help, but it's not that big of a deal. Well, the bottom line is that uh, if you use this, this expression, this is by definition sine squared of e over 2, cosine squared of e over 2, which of course you remember gives you this. Of course, we all know that, right? And you do the same with the cosine of theta, you get to this expression. This is really the one that you want to use to relate the, the two angles. That's all you need to remember, if you really want to remember anything, is that we define the eccentric anomaly that way, starting from that CV distance, you find the relationships, as many as you want, playing with trigonometric functions, uh, and, and bottom line is that if you really want to have no ambiguity, this is the one you want to use. If I stick here the value of theta between 0 and pi and 2 pi, I'm going to go with the argument of this tangent function between 0 and pi. And the tangent is great between 0 and pi. I, well, there is an image that I wanted to show you. Yeah, let's do that. I think the book will still open if I'm not online, right? I don't know. <coughs> Do you have any questions in the meantime? I'm not done finding the actual final equation that I want to solve numerically, but... So I want all you did was change the sine, sine to the Well, use this, this property of sines and cosines, right? Of, of, you know, this is a trigonometric relationship. If you have the tangent squared of an angle over 2, it's also equal to this expression. Do the same for the cosine of theta. Uh, substitute, uh, and, and, and you, you do get that expression. It's really not a big deal how you get there. Is you need to know that you want to use this one, because otherwise you're going to find yourself without knowing, if I give you a theta value, what, what is the e that you need to use. With that equation, do you want to find e at the end of the day? Well, when, once I'm done here, I'm almost done finding the equation that allows me to find big E. 
then from here you can go one way or the other. For example, big E is going to be twice the arctangent of that expression, right? And this should look familiar. The moment I remove the screen, you will see it. Yeah, right, that's great. If you want, you can, I have a book with these other little red projector. Ah. Okay, we're done. We're, we can't have this class because the Wi-Fi doesn't work. It says that I'm connected. Mm, that's okay. Professor? Yes. Does that function still hold when theta is equal to pi? Theta equals to pi. What is the tangent of pi over 2? What is that? That's why I wanted to show you how this works. I mean, I don't know in, on that book. That's okay. Let's let's no. let's move on. So, um, it is it is undefined. Well, it isn't really. I mean, the, 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 what what's going to happen is is what is the arc whose tangent is say that you stick the pi over to that. This this will give you a plus infinity, right? But the angle that gives you plus infinity, it's, it's what? You do know what that is. So if I, if, I, if I have infinity here, plus infinity, what is, how does the tangent look like? Well, that's terrible with the screen on. Uh, yeah, I don't think we need this anymore. So. If this is your, uh, these are your quadrants here, the you know, unit circle, you do the tangent at this point, and uh, okay, you are approaching with theta, we said approaches pi, which means that theta over two approaches pi over two. What is the tangent of pi over two? It's not defined, but it's basically, you're going to plus infinity, right? Which means, um, that if I do the arc tangent, I'm getting another pi over two, so I can still find the big E value. Do you see that? No? Okay. And think about, think about this. Okay, circle, the big circle around this. Uh, your theta goes, here, right? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, you want to go. You want to go to pi. Yeah, your theta goes here, right? All the way around. Well, your big E is also doing the same. So you can still find it. Yep. Uh, and I had software to show you that. But let's 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 finish. At uh, least finish this. Okay. So. Keep this there. Uh, the other way around is also valid. Uh, you can solve for theta if you're given E, which is really what we're going to do. Okay. Well, um, I think I can substitute everything, right? So this equation is ME, this expression, mu squared over h cubed, parentheses, 1 minus e squared, 3 over 2t. This is ME, right? And then on the right hand side, I have that expression. And I do recognize everything that I have on this board. Uh, two arc tangent, where is this? This is, this is the one. That's all I see, right? That, that's big E. That's big E minus little e sine of E. This is my Kepler's equation. Okay? 
So that is the one that, as you can imagine, you, if you need to find, so if I give you time, it means you know this, right? I'm asking you, what is the satellite at minute 30 from passenger perigee? I'm giving you this, this is a number. You just substitute and you get a number. Then you have to solve for big E, which is, quite frankly, if you have to put it in MATLAB, this is a much nicer expression to solve that, that one, okay? So you solve numerically for big E, uh, because this doesn't have, this doesn't have a analytical solution. And then, once you find big E, well, you go here, which, so, which means that I probably want to invert this expression and just uh, do the opposite, find theta as a function of big E. So theta is what? Uh, now it's twice the arc tangent of the inverse of that expression, 1 plus E, 1 minus E, tangent of E over 2. So this is the procedure. If you are given time, that is the hard part to solve. Again, if I give you theta and you want to find the time, that's done immediately. There's no numerical solution, nothing you have to do. But if you are given time, what you do is compute big ME solve Kepler's equation, and this means numerically, and I was really hoping to use these last few minutes to show you, but I don't know what's going on with my computer and the Wi-Fi, I'm going to try again. And then, which means, solving this means that you find, so solve means that you find E, big E. And then, um, well, compute, that's what you have to do, compute theta from here. And that's perfectly doable as, uh, also when you're going towards pi over 2. Um, until I get this to work, do you have any other questions? No? So what does this all like, what does the big E give us at the end of the day? The big E gives, gives you that angle, nothing else. Um, the big E is a, an auxiliary, auxiliary variable that I have introduced just to get rid of those pretty nasty expressions so that you have something that is a little easier to handle. This can be solved numerically, it's not that big of a deal. The expression I had before it was a little more painful uh, to solve. So again, the big, the big E is defined as, you imagine this circle of radius A around your elliptical orbit. This is your actual position, so say that I'm telling you um, that, that I want to know where I am at a certain time. Well, you first find this angle here, big E, and then you find theta. It is simply much easier to solve this and then substitute in that expression. Uh, I, I don't know what I have to do. Do you, um, do you guys have a MATLAB um, open or something that I can hook up that it's hopefully running? No? I can show you the code. That's not going to help much, probably. Yes. This is only for elliptical and circular, but circular, I mean, it's a linear relationship. So this is still going to work, but uh, if you put circular here, that means this goes away, the E becomes theta, they are the same thing because it's already on a circle, and so, and you get again the same equation that we had before, that T is proportional to theta, and nothing else. So this only is valid for those. Um, if you guys have a few minutes of patience, we still have six minutes, I can keep trying. What about you have visitor, does that work? Yes. <sighs> Cancel. What do I have to do? Give them my cell phone number or what, what do I need to do? Wow. It keeps failing on me. I think from now on I'm going to upload the stuff on my website and use... Uh, yeah, but I have to say, how do I send you the files?
I don't have a thumb drive. Maybe I do. Yeah, I do. Lego thumb drive. Yeah. Thank you. Can you connect that in the meantime? I don't know how. Yeah, there is one. All right, let me get this thing. Quick. Let me get Kepler, Kepler. Okay, good. Thanks. Are we still recording? Yeah, but it's not filming. What? It's not? It's not filming. This area. Oh, great, great, great. Can I just open this? If you want to load it. Yeah, nice. It's working. Is it a laptop? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, uh, let's see an example here. Whenever that comes on. I have the same elliptical orbit I think I gave you for home the uncollected homework. Uh, and so I'm asking myself here, you know, where is the spacecraft after, after an orbital period or things of that kind? I just change the type. So here it is. Uh, it's the same as you see. It's the same orbit. Uh, can I make this bigger? Maybe? Nah. Yeah, you can drag it off, undock it. Thanks. I don't know what happened. Shouldn't touch computers today, probably. Okay, same orbit, so nothing is new here. Uh, this actually gave you the code that does this stuff. Uh, and so now we get to solving Kepler's equations for, for equation for an ellipse. So I'm asking, okay, this is where I want to know what the theta is. Define the uh, mean anomaly, nothing special, 2 pi over the orbital period times that time. Now, you need to solve an equation numerically, which is this one. In other words, you need to solve E minus little e sine of big E minus m e equals zero. So you need to find the zero of this equation, where big E needs to be to give you a zero. And so to do it in MATLAB, you need to define a function like that, that you're going to zero out. And so that's my Kepler function, very simple. E minus little e sine of big E minus m e. So I'm going to try to find the zero of that, and there is a function in MATLAB that does it for you, which is f0, right? That's what I'm using. And so you need to give it an initial guess, because this is a numerical uh, solution. Newton's method to solve four equations should sound familiar. Uh, you know, it tries until it converges to the solution. And so by running that, it should give me the eccentric anomaly in the grease and radiance, and it should give me also the actual true anomaly through this conversion here, this second to last line is that um, and I don't know where the result is, it should be here oh yeah, here it is so uh, what am I doing in this example? I'm asking where am I after an orbital period? the theta side was actually just, you know, a sanity check half orbital period needs to be at apogee and that's what I'm getting 180 eccentric anomaly, and 180 true anomaly, they are together as in that sketch that I gave you. But you can change and, you know, have any values you want here is going to give you something meaningful. Now, your question about, again, what happens if theta is pi? First of all, um, if you have a value of theta, um, what would you do? If you have a value of theta, then you compute the e from here, and then, then you stick it in there, right? Does it make sense? That, that if you have a theta value, yes, and you want to know the time, it's not, you don't you have to solve anything numerically again. It becomes tangent negative 1 of infinity? Yeah, what is that? That would be the power of 2. Right? Yeah, you get an angle. 
I mean, it's undefined, but we know what it is. <laughs> Was that a disagreement? Sound? I mean, we say that it's undefined, but when you get a tangent that goes to plus infinity, you know that you are a pi over 2. So again, if you give me the angle, uh, there is nothing you need to solve numerically. If you give me the angle, uh, you can compute the time. The problem is when you give me the time and you want to compute where you are, then you have to do it numerically. Okay? Yes? Now that doesn't have any issues with the being near infinity or the uh, I don't think in this example, I don't think it does any, no, I don't think so. I don't. I never tried. I don't think, well, you can't really enter infinity. You can do, what is, what is the highest number? What is the name of that variable in MATLAB? Arc tangent of, I don't think it will understand infinity. Does it, in, does it understand infinity? Yeah, it does. So that's your answer. MATLAB can do it. If MATLAB can do it, you can do it. <laughs> All right? I'll post these and you can play with this software.